I want to call to order the Finance and Audit uh, Committee meeting. It is um, August the 10th. And I'm um, going to read the statement of announcement. A meeting notice announcing the date, time, and place of the August 10th, 2022 Finance and Audit Committee meeting was distributed August 9th, 2022 to appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested the notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs Central Administrative Office and on the website. In accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, mobility assistance, or other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs if requested in advance. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda is the invocation. I'll say that for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome privilege and opportunity to serve the most vulnerable citizens of South Carolina. Help us be good stewards of the state's money and find fiscally smart solutions to improve and solve complex problems within our limited resources. Bless and find favor with DDSN employees who debate, devote countless hours of time and energy to this agency and bless them for their work and sacrifices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, the <clears throat> next item is um, the adoption of the agenda. Today, um, our committee is short one member, um, Commissioner Woodhead. It was unable to join us today. So um, I, Ed and I will be uh, making the decisions, and um, when Ed makes a motion, I will be uh, basically a motion in a second since it's just the two of us. Um, and we'll advance discussions based on the fact that we're missing one uh, member of our committee, but we still have a majority because it's a member, a committee of three, and there's two here. So that's how we'll proceed <laughs> since we have one missing. Um, uh, committee member today. So um, if uh, I can get a motion and a second from Ed to adopt the agenda. So moved and second. Okay, great. Uh, agenda is adopted as presented. Um, the next item is um, the minutes from the July um, Finance and Audit Committee um, meeting. I do have one correction in the minutes um, as presented, and that correction is on page four under item 10 for the roof replacement. The, uh, the building's um, roof was last replaced on 20, 2001, according to Andrew Theron. And um, I just wanna make sure that the minutes reflect that it's 2001 and not 2021. So once that is corrected uh, and amended, um, the minutes um, are uh, can be approved as Ed makes a motion to approve the minutes with the amendment. So moved and second. Great. Okay. Uh, the minutes from the July meeting are uh, approved with the one correction on the date. Um, all right. So the next item on our agenda is the Finance and Audit Committee procedures. Um, I have reviewed those um, uh, procedures, uh, which are included in our packet on page seven, um, Ed, and um, I suggest no changes to this document that uh, was approved by the commission in, uh, on January 21st, 2021. Um, Ed, if you don't have any um, suggestions for any other edits to this these procedures that have been in place we will have the um, full commission vote on the procedures in our next meeting so if no changes we'll okay. proceed with taking it to the full commission okay all right so no changes on the um, committee procedures um, for the finance and audit committee the next item um, for today is the fiscal 23 spending plan. Um, and Nancy Wilmbaugh is going to talk us through that and lead the discussion uh, on this pretty big item for the agency. Good afternoon. Thanks 
Okay. In your agenda, the suspending plan for 23. The top part is the revenue what we can earn this year. It also includes the wash that we have at HHS, 644.4 million. So our revenue for this current year, recurring revenue would be 942 million. Recurring expenditures would be 938.5. So your top two parts shows that we as an agency are sustainable with our money without using any non-recurring funds that we brought forward. It shows that we have a net operating lapse of 3.4 million for this current year. The bottom part shows our cash carry forward of 128.5 million, and that's the combination of the 6.2 F map and cash carry forward from our operating Medicaid revenue from last year. Um, all right, and we're going to talk through some of the new initiatives, correct, that are being proposed yeah. next, probably. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm looking uh, for Dr. Fry and Lori yeah. and Janet to. Help, do that through those initiatives. Okay, okay. Um, just see. Um, uh, clarify a little bit on um, the fourth item down um, the DHH's waiver participants, the state plan medical. State, the state plan medical is your state plan. That's your doctor uh, appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, someone breaks their arm, or right. the doctor snipples, things that are not in waiver services. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Um, all right. We refer to that as the state medical plan. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. And the COLA item is the um, cost of living adjustment, right? Okay. That's correct. And that's an estimate. We have not received that from the state yet. So that's my estimate as to what I believe they will give us. Did we have that in our 2022 budget as well, COLA? Do you remember? Was it approved? Was it, it built in? To right. When for the, the, well, for last year's. Right, the 2022 one. We usually do not give any of the COLA information until the last week of August. I just can't remember if it was. Um, we did an estimate last more. year and put it in there. Okay, you did. Okay. How far off do you do you know we were we with that? Was there any like like comparison of like what I'm, we? I'm sorry, I don't remember how far we were. I can find out. I can go okay. back and look. I just was um. Uh, seeing if I could actually put my hand on last last year's um, uh, notes on on COLA just to see what it ended up um, being, you know, because we estimated probably the same then. Just curious, like how it actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, how close we were, I guess, um, in that in that cost that, that uh, revenue. Um, okay, so. Um, I guess get some information on that. Sure. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll, go, I'll go ahead and just okay. and talk through some of these. Um, so under new initiatives, some of these items you all are already familiar with because we've already brought them to you. So they're just reflected a second time. So I'm not yeah. going to um, go through them in detail. So that would include yeah. the, the ITAC. Um, uh, which is the first item. The second item, um, crisis stabilization. We are excited um, to uh, seek permission to develop and implement this program. So um, South Carolina does not currently have sufficient options for supporting people um, through residential services 
or for stabilizing uh, individuals who are duly diagnosed with mental illness and or have complex behavior needs so that they can be appropriately supported in, with residential services. There are a number of challenges in finding appropriate supports and services for these individuals. Um, we are, uh, we have spent a lot of time looking at models in other states who have um, more options. And what we are trying to do is um, establish a proof of concept for what it will take to serve these individuals and support them. Um, this is, and I, you all have a memo and it's, I know it's posted online and I don't want to read it because it's a little lengthy, but, um, what we are hoping to do is have both something at one of our regional centers as well as a cooperative model um, alongside a, in a, with a, a provider in the community. Uh, many of these are the individuals who we see in crisis and in waiting, um, and they continue to be there because they cannot be stabilized. We um, have worked hard to think through what the staffing requirements would be. Um, and we hope that um, by establishing this, we would be able to get the data to validate and work with HHS to eventually um, hope to see this become a waiver service. Um, but for now, this would be entirely state funded and uh, would be tapping into those state dollars. And we'll continue if we uh, to work with the legislative committee to seek a recurring appropriation. Otherwise, we would keep drawing down out of what is otherwise available cash carry forward. But our hope would be to get see this become recurring dollars to the legislature or after we can validate that it works um, work with HHS and hopefully uh, see this become a match of a label, labor service. But as presented here, this is the entire state dollars. Um, do you have a sense of like how many people annually or within the last year kind of have been kind of in this, this, this segment of our of need? You know, would you no, dozens. I'm going to look to Janet to see if she wants to give a more precise number. Um, I, we quickly, we were over 20 when we were estimating pretty quickly, and that did. Uh, you know, as far as a number over the past year, I really can't. I have I've not been in this position, you know, for, for long enough to get a sense for that. I know that right now we could fill 20, 24 beds. Today. All right. Just this so this is, you know, this is a significant need. This will not be a full cure, but what we really need to do is establish what works. And we might need to come forward and ask <laughs> for more, but what we want to yeah. do is um, start, establish a proof of concept, ensure we know what works. I think doing this at the same time that we've established the ITAC will really allow us to make sure that we're working within best practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I know that, that there's a huge need for this and um, I um, personally uh, appreciate the work behind looking at solutions to, to deal with the situation and to really manage the crisis that we really have um, with complex, you know, behavioral, um, highly complex individuals. Um, so, um, okay, um, I don't have any questions on that particular program. Um, any other questions? Or can we get into the next one? Okay. Uh, the second one is a proposed grant for um, a capital investment for the youth uh, res hab homes. So um, 
as you all know, the, the local boards can access dollars through the housing trust fund. Um, however, any private providers cannot access those. Um, we did receive uh, one-time dollars from the legislature to uh, hope to stand up three to four homes to, to serve this population where, again, there is need um, and this would not fully address all need. But we believe um, to make it attractive and recruit providers that we need to um, make capital available to anyone coming uh, to fulfill this. Again, we've looked at other states who have similar programs and they are um, making capital available. It might not be that we would expend the full 1.2 because if there was a mix and some people used housing trust fund dollars and some wanted to apply for this, uh, but we wanted to estimate as if there were four applicants. You're tying some of this money to the 6.2 F map. Yes, it, uh, it's a, a with the 6.2 F map dollars, we like to dip into those when this would be one time money, right? Yeah. So um, we, when we know it's a program that's a one time money program, that's a, a great bucket of dollars to look to. And we still have uh, 59 million, right, in our 6.2 F map. And is that the that says the revenue number, so I don't know if that's yes. the balance. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, then we can move to the next initiative. Yeah. So uh, we want to propose uh, establishing grants to um, encourage the establishment of um, cooperative training and staffing programs across the providers. We know that um, the, this is a time of significant transition and also significant challenges in the labor market. Um, and we have talked with providers and also looked at to other states again. And we believe, um, you know, th I'm thinking of these in terms of two buckets. One, through a cooperative model, there are, especially for some of the smaller providers or even the larger, you may have functions that there's not enough work to justify an FTE. It's also sometimes difficult to be able to recruit part-time individuals. So our hope is um, with approval, we would establish a grant program um, so that there could be uh, cooperative models developed across multiple providers. The co-op itself would have full-time staff that may be utilized by participating providers for the functions that they identify in the grant. So some that we have heard have been finance positions, HR positions. Um, you may not have enough finance function to justify a full-time finance director, um, but you might want to be a participant in a co-op where you can gain access to some uh, support from those staff. Um, and then the same with training models. So we have heard um, there are training needs and our hope is they know most uh, local control to allow them to identify what those training needs would be. Um, and uh, this would allow shared resources. We're proposing for each bucket $200,000. Again, starting with a proof of concept, if we identify that um, additional resources or need for grants such as these, then we would bring it back to finance and audit. But this was, um, we looked at, there are some other grant programs either in other states or federal um, that establish some cooperative models and cooperative functions akin to this. And we thought that this was a conservative approach to uh, establish a proof of concept. Who, who would like, what department would run this? The grant program? Yeah, like who it, the administrative office would be, like what division would be like overseeing this? Would it would be? fall under our admin, so under Lauren Davis. Okay. Um, she's going to have the, she has all strategic initiatives. She also has the contracts division, which we're working with. Of course, 
you know, we work cross functionally, so there wouldn't necessarily be some interfacing with finance because that's where the dollars are going. But in terms of oversight of a grant program and right. evaluation analysis, that would be under our land. Um, so the cooperative would be operating outside of DDSN, managed by, like, who would be, like, running the actual, like, logistically managing, program managing what we're offering, I guess, all the providers? The co-op itself would. Okay. How do you recruit, like, how do you identify, I mean, how do you build and create the co-op? I mean, like what's the well that's plan? part of what the that's what the grants are for right to help the applicants establish what the cooperative model would be um but usually your co-op is going to be an, an independent entity with participating providers so it would have the co-op itself would be an independent entity it is not us okay this is essentially giving them startup funds to get moving. And then this idea, like you said, was well received by providers. Well, we haven't. No. I, uh, I, I about them. What, to them. We have recognized that there is need for training and staffing by providers. Yeah, there is. Some shared staffing. Yeah. We did not. Um, that was what I was saying. We're being responsive to recognized okay. needs. Um, yeah, I, knew, I do know they have a lot of training needs, specifically, and, you know, staffing needs, too, so, um, okay, so the cooperative is a solution. So. It's a solution of, you know, just thinking about, um, the most feasible way to use dollars to have the best impact, while also being mindful of the that the localities recognize where the, what their needs are. Right. Okay, we'll move to the next um, item initiative. Um, I'm going to look up to Lori to talk about intellectability. Okay. So DDSN currently has um, a relationship with intellectability. They um, are the trainers and certifiers of the person-centered thinking training for case managers and um, residential staff. They developed um, a PCT training that is um, virtual that sits on their learning management system for direct support professionals, kind of takes it full circle. Um, they house the electronic person-centered description for um, all of the waiver participants that we have. It's a requirement as part of um, the case management service. So what we're doing is seeking to expand the contract with intellectability to allow them to expand some of the training, um, the use of their learning management system to house those trainings, as well as um, maybe trainings that are a little outside of person-centered thinking. Um, we, they also are the creators of the health risk screening tool, which DDSN has used um, in some capacity for many years. I don't know when we started, um, but we use it for specific populations of people. So part of that contract will be to consider expanding the use of the HRST um, for people that are seeking, you know, to move to different placements. Really, just an expansion of their contract. All right. Um, all right. So, under new initiatives, um, what's the difference between um, of maintenance and regional center improvements? The difference. There? Um, I'll let Nancy talk about okay. Nancy should talk about effort of okay. maintenance, okay. and then Andrew can present on regional centers. Okay. All right. Um, under the effort of maintenance, with overseeing all our waivers throughout the state, 
um, there's been some increased needs through CMS and HHS that we review all level of cares for every consumer. So we are having to um, build extra staff to be able to accomplish these needs. That's helpful in knowing what that line item means. Okay, and then I kind of know what the regional, I mean, center for goods are if they're not with, you know, same yeah. Well, uh, essentially what we did was was put a call out to all the regional centers and, and try to get figure out what they needed. And this was a list of generally what came back. Um, and the deferred maintenance down at the bottom, that includes a lot of our proactive spending that were, you know, a lot of our curb appeal projects that we're trying to get into. I think everything else is pretty self-explanatory with vehicles, furniture, and cameras. But the deferred maintenance is, is it's our, our annual care maintenance budget plus this proactive budget that we're trying to trying to work into as well. So. Where, where does the money come for the maintenance of the state and facilities like which bucket is that like tied to because it's an expenditure right and it's our responsibility to cover maintenance of the state owned facilities that we still have are you talking about the uh, the community residences yeah well i think most of them fall under a residence but they're the the list of all the state owned uh, properties that we have that we're required to um, you know, maintain or whatever um, I just was curious, like where that falls. It's up under the residential programs, under your ICFs. Is that on page ten or somewhere else? <laughs> Are you looking at um, you looking at the the main spending plan summary? Yes. Okay, so you said it's under uh, under your regional centers. Okay, gotcha. The 103. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So that would be that would be where. Okay. Even though the state-owned properties are not part of regional centers, though. They're usually they're residential. Well, if you look, there's this line item here. See DDS and state-owned ICF maintenance. Oh, oh yeah. Each one of those okay, are separate gotcha. line items. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, all right. Um, this um, spinning plan. Um, All right, then um, that is everything to be presented to us regarding the spending plan. Then I guess um, we need to bring this plan out of committee and have the full commission um, vote on it uh, this month. Correct. Yeah. So. Um, and if you uh, are good with um, what they've presented, we can bring it out of the committee um, as appro approved as presented and then let the full commission bless it on um, next Thursday. In agreement. Okay, so I'll let you make a motion in a second, but uh, we are approving this uh, spending plan as presented um, for fiscal year 2023. So move a second. Great. All right. So um, spending plan um, is approved by the committee and we'll go to the commission uh, next Thursday for uh, a vote. Um, all right. <clears throat> the next item um, on our agenda is um, financial update. Nancy. 
a financial update, and I'm not sure what page or tab it's under. 18. 18. Page 18. Yeah. So this is the first month of our proposed spending plan versus our actual expenditures. Right. Um, so cash expenditures for the month of July was 21.9. The wash at HHS was estimated at 46.9 million, total expenditure 68.9 million. Um, so it shows that we were under our budget by 0.99% at this point in time. Just need a motion and a second to take it to um, commission and change. Great. So moved and second. Second by Commissioner Rawlinson. Well, um, I don't think so. I don't think we need. Yeah, thank you, though. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So this spending plan is approved by the committee and um, will be brought and shared with the commission um, for their final approval too, as presented by the, the agency. So, okay. So the next item um, is the update on the appraised value of the York County property, um, Diane Road, um, Andrew Barron. Yes, this is just for the consideration of the surplus of these properties. Um, I know we, we uh, revisited it here a couple of months ago right now, but um, that's okay. We've got some more information from it. Our last update, we had received an updated appraisal on the property. It came in about $35,000, which was higher than the 2019 appraisal of $20,000. Um, I think the sentiment at the time was that um, 35 was the appraised price. What can it list for? What can we, what can we actually sell it for? I reached out to uh, Lindsay Riel with uh, uh, yeah, with CBRE, who is the um, state contract real estate agent who would, who would list this thing. Okay. Um, they pulled some more comps, looked at the appraisal, and they came back and thought the $35,000 was, was probably about right or maybe even a little high for that property, which um, you know, kind of surprised me a little bit based on their appraisal value. Right. But, um, but that was their general sentiment. It was based on the rural location, low uh, resident density. And the, uh, there's a creek that runs in the back of the property and essentially makes 20% of it a flood floodplain. So um, those things factored in, I think $35,000 is what they're looking at for a list price. Now, we could only list it or sell it for, you know, as low as the appraised value. So that would probably be what we would list it at once, okay. it, once it goes live. So. Gotcha. All right. Well, I appreciate that um, due diligence and kind of looking to make sure since so much time had passed when we first approved the um, the item the, the the real estate to be um, sold so um, I appreciate that work and I am uh, comfortable with with the proposed rate uh, or listing price um, or that you've proposed or that the the, um, the agent has proposed um, so if Ed, if you're good with that, we can approve it out of this committee and take it to the full commission, correct? I imagine we would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we um, approve the um, uh, provider approval to um, <coughs> sell lots two and three uh, on Diane Road in York County. So, all right. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so the next item on our agenda is the internal um, audit update by Courtney. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'll start with our update on our agreed upon procedures report. So we have completed the review of 35 of the 40 agreed upon procedures reports for the DSM boards with five in process. The review is complete for seven of the nine private providers with June 30 year ends, two in process. 
Three of the private providers have September 30 year ends. We've completed the review of two of those and have not received the third report, but we're hearing that we should be receiving it any day. Um, the reports were due on April 30th for 33 private providers with a December 31st year end. We have received 31 of those reports. The review is complete for 25 with six in process. We have one provider with a March 31st year end. Their report was due July 31st. It has been received and that review is complete. Our contract reductions for 2021 are currently at $47,500. So our audit observation tracking report was updated for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 22, and we emailed that to the commissioners on July 15th. So since our update at the July meeting, we completed procedures and issued follow up memos to three providers and the tracking report includes the updated status for those corrective action plans. And lastly, you should have a copy of the proposed audit plan for fiscal year 23 in front of you. So the plan is an outline of individual audit projects to be conducted during the year. So it's developed based on our current audit resources and capabilities, and it includes a schedule of estimated audit resources. So that's the back page there. So our audit projects are selected using a risk based approach and it includes consideration of commission and management request. So we broke those projects down into DDSN areas and also the provider network and you have tables there in the audit plan that include preliminary objectives for each project. So those preliminary objectives are general in terms. And specific objectives um, would be developed during audit planning when we do an engagement level risk assessment. So the plan also dedicates hours to the review of agreed upon procedures reports to our follow up procedures um, for training for consumer funds and personal property and also some general administrative activities. So that includes our uh, quality assurance and improvement program and also continuing education that's required by internal audit standards. So we've also reserved some hours for unplanned audits or technical assistance visits that may be requested during the year. So that plan is designed to be flexible. Um, it may be updated for changes in priorities or audit resources. And we would bring any significant changes to the plan to you for review and approval. So in accordance with our internal audit charter, which is DDSN directed to 7505, we are presenting the fiscal year 23 audit plan to the committee for review and approval. So I believe we're going to need a motion to approve that fiscal year 23 audit plan as presented. And then brought to to approve as well. Right. Yeah. Thursday. Okay. All right. Um, I, I think um, what you have here is, um, is um, looks looks good to me, and I um, appreciate the level of detail. Um, you know, for an audit plan, um, internal audit plan. I don't know that we've operated off one in the last few years, so it's nice to see in, you know, a plan that is going to lead us through um, the next, you know, this, this current year now that we're in. Um, so I appreciate working on this and identifying the areas of need so the commission can be on the same page and up, up, up to speed with with what you are going to be doing and what it's going to take to do what you're doing and all those details that will help us um, knowledgeable about what goes into um, your team and the staff and what you need to do, what you have to do. So um, I am good. I don't have any uh, other questions today. So if Ed wants, doesn't have any questions or anything else, we can, we can make a motion. We can um, approve this as, as presented. I don't have any questions. 
Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. State the uh, motion again. <laughs> so a motion to approve the fiscal year 23 audit plan as presented. I'll so move and second the motion. Thank you. All right. So the plan, the internal audit plan um, as presented today to the committee uh, is uh, approved as presented and written and will be shared with the um, commission next Thursday for their final approval. So, okay. Thank you, Courtney. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, next item on the agenda is um, Nancy uh, is going to um, provide us with the uh, chief financial update for the agency. Um, for the, the state audit, the yes. agreed upon procedures, we had our findings, we responded. Um, we should be hearing back with a final report that we'll be able to share. The things that were uh, the findings were minor and immaterial. Um, overall, I thought it was real good. So once the final report is here, we'll be able to share it with you. Okay. Um, fiscal year 20 cost reports being so I'm a little clear down to one committee member. So I wonder, um, I okay. recommend that we take um, a five minute recess. Okay, so, so we can't take any action right now. Yeah, do we need to have that. action to take or is it just informational? I don't think, so. I don't think I'm just, it's just an update, but. That's fine, we can, we can take a, um, a minute for Ed to join us back and, and yeah, we'll adjourn for five minutes. Okay, so we've had the state audit report that should be final soon. We'll be able to share the findings were minor in material. Um, fiscal year 20 cost report is on, on track. It's being reviewed now, so and it will be ready before August 14th. Um, cost settlements for all our contracts. Um, 21 has been done. I need to review it and, and see what it looks like. And the staff are now beginning to work on fiscal year 20. So we're kind of going backwards. So once we have some of those years completed, we'll bring those to you for you to see. Okay, and these are for the providers, right? Or the, uh, providers. the providers, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, gotcha. All right. And that's all. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that update. And, um, uh, our next meeting um, is likely going to be September 7th at 3.30, and um, we will adjourn our meeting at 3, at 4.15. So, so thank you.